The following is a lecture given by His Holiness Jaya Bhattaka Swami on September 26, 1984 at Marari Savak Farm in Mulberry, Tennessee. The class begins with a reading from the Srimad Bhagavatam, 1st Canto, Chapter 7, Verse 9. Savai nibriti nirata Sarvatro pekshako muni Kasyava brihating eta Atma dama samabhyasat Sri Sonaka said Sri Sonaka asked Sutta Goswami Shri Shukadev Goswami was already on the path of self-realization. And thus he was pleased with his own self. So why did he take the trouble to undergo the study of such a vast literature? Translation with repetition. Sri Saunaka asks Sutta Goswami. Sri Saunaka asks Sutta Goswami. Sri Sukadev Goswami was already. Sri Sukadev Goswami was already on the path of self-realization. On the path of self-realization. And thus he was pleased. And thus he was pleased with his own self. With his own self. So why did he take the trouble? So why did he take the trouble to undergo the study? To undergo of such a vast literature. Of such a vast literature. Purport. For the people in general, the highest perfection of life is to cease from material activities and be fixed on the path of self realization. Those who take pleasure in sense enjoyment or those who are fixed in the material bodily welfare work are called karmis. Out of thousands and millions of such karmis, one may become an atma rama by self-realization. Atma means self and arama means to take pleasure. Everyone is searching after the highest pleasure, but the standard of pleasure of one may be different from the standard of another. Therefore, the standard of pleasure enjoyed by the karmis is different from that of the atma ramas. The Atmaramas are completely indifferent to material enjoyment in every respect. Srila Sukadeva Goswami had already attained that stage. And still he was attracted to undergo the trouble of studying the great Bhagavatam literature. This means that Srimad Bhagavatam is a postgraduate study even for the Atmaramas who have surpassed all the studies of Vedic knowledge. Thus, in the Bhaktivedanta purport of text 9, chapter 7, canto 1 of the Srimad Bhagavatam, in the matter of the son of Drona punished. Srila Prabhupada ki. So, here is the conclusive proof of how exalted is the <coughs> study of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Actually by the Srimad Bhagavatam alone one can achieve all perfection. The Srimad Bhagavatam is known as uh, Amala Purana. It's the spotless Purana. The Purana that is free of all material conceptions. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says that those who are too attached to fruitive activities, their minds are bewildered by the words of the uh, flowery Vedas. (coughs) 
But here we can understand that the Srimad Bhagavatam surpasses the Vedas because the Srimad Bhagavatam is teaching one Nivritti Marg or the path of renunciation, the path of becoming completely uh, fixed up within God consciousness. <clears throat> Most scriptures teach one the Pravitti Marg which is the path of material sense enjoyment. And they tell one how one can enjoy so that in the future there's a better chance for going back to Godhead. But here in the Srimad Bhagavatam, this especially explain that the real purpose of the Bhagavatam is not to perpetuate one's material enjoyment, but to fix one up on the transcendental platform so that one can return back to home, back to Godhead without any difficulty. So, this is very wonderful that the Srimad Bhagavatam is, uh, on, at the one hand, such a rare book that even complete liberated souls they study it to gain further insight into the Absolute Truth. And this highest of all Vedic literatures is now available to uh, the Western people in their own languages, especially English, German, Spanish, Sw Swedish, and so on, French, Italian. Because by this study, then the same perfection that was achieved by Sukadev Goswami might also be achieved or may also be achieved by the devotees who are studying the Srimad Bhagavatam today. So we can understand that the standard of pleasure that one achieves by studying the Srimad Bhagavatam is many times or millions of times more, unlimited times more than the happiness that one would achieve through any form of material activity. Because even the Ganis, they have already rejected material happiness and they have become liberated. But here it clearly explains that even those liberated souls, they find further enlightenment and transcendental bliss by studying the Srimad Bhagavatam. Therefore, the Srimad Bhagavatam is the most elevated transcendental literature. The <clears throat> when Lord Chaitanya was touring, when he was going on his travels, he came to a place which was known as Baraha Nagar, or the city named after Baraha Dev. And when he reached there, he found that there was this uh, pandit who was giving uh, lectures on the Bhagavatam. So Lord Chaitanya was naturally very pleased. But then he found that that pandit, that his Bhagavatam was a little bit old, At the same time, he liked the Bhagavatam class that uh, the Pandit was giving very much. So when that Pandit asked for Lord Chaitanya for an order, how he should lead his spiritual life, what should be his specific practice of devotional service, then Lord Chaitanya ordered him that his practice should be that he should daily read the Srimad Bhagavatam. He should read the Srimad Bhagavatam. And actually he became known as Bhagavat Acharya. And his daily sadhana was that he would, 18, 20 hours, 24 hours a day, he'd simply be giving Bhagavatam class. It's a non-stop yagya. That practically he would just continually give Bhagavatam class on a regular basis. That would be that was his 
specific service assigned by Lord Chaitanya to him. And okay, they claim that Lord Chaitanya gave him a few fresh pages from memory, that Lord Chaitanya had the entire Bhagavatam memorized, and when there was that he wrote some pages, and they claim that the original pages written by Lord Chaitanya are there. That's hard to ascertain. But there's a fact that this ashram of the Bhagavad Acharya is still there. That actually uh, he was uh, this one associate of Lord Chaitanya. That it was his specific service was continually just to read the Bhagavatam. And by that he became completely perfected. So this Bhagavatam is very, very important. Because there are so many religious books in the world. And religious books and scriptures, they contain uh, transcendental words. But most of the instructions of the scriptures are not actually transcendental. The transcendental words are very few and far between and they're mixed up within the other instructions. So that one is continually hearing compromises for how to enjoy in the material world how to enjoy and at the same time how to do that in such a way that it's not offensive to God very much. But actually how to develop love for God and how to realize the absolute truth, how to remain on the transcendental platform, how to return back to the kingdom of Godhead. This process, even a liberated soul is interested in knowing more and more about plus the details about the Supreme Personality of Godhead and the uh, transcendental nature of uh, His devotional service. This topic is nowhere discussed in as great a clarity and voluminous uh, manner as in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Therefore, the Srimad Bhagavatam is uh, accepted by all the Paramahamsas and great souls as the most authoritative literature on this science of God consciousness. The Vedas describe it as the ripened fruit of the Vedic tree. There's a saying in Bengali, if you want to know what tree that is, then by its fruit it is known. Just like on the side of the hill over there, there's some trees. You ask, what is that tree? They say, it's an apple tree. Because it produces the apple fruit. Or it's a peach tree, or it's a pear tree, or it's an oak. It produces the oak seeds or something. But generally a tree, mango tree, orange tree, they're all known by the fruit they produce. So similarly, they say that the ripened fruit of the Vedas is a Srimad Bhagavatam. If you want to know the actual purpose of the Vedas, then you study the Srimad Bhagavatam. The purpose of that particular tree, its actual, what is the value of it? If you take an apple tree and you study its bark, you study its roots, you study its leaves, but the real greatest value of that tree is the apple fruit. That is actually what it, that's why people plant it. Because that's the most valuable thing that it produces. So the Veda is the most valuable thing that it produced. Its fruit, its uh, <clears throat> essence is the Srimad Bhagavatam. So if someone wants to know what is the entire purpose of the Bhagavata, of the Vedas, what is the real secret nomenclature of the Vedas, you don't have to read all the Upanishad, Purana, Mahabharata, simply by reading the Mahapuranam, the Srimad Bhagavatam, then all of the purports of the Vedas, all of the uh, objectives of the Vedas are fulfilled simply by perfectly reading the Srimad Bhagavatam. When Lord Chaitanya was instructing Rupa Goswami, then he explained the different categories of uh, animals and life and jiva, living entities, and then different categories of human beings. So first he said that uh, 
amongst all the animals, of course, the human being is uh, most important. But there are many tribal kind of uncivilized human beings, sabors, bodas, and so on. And then more elevated than these type of uncivilized uh, human beings, those who engage in meat eating and hunting and other kind of violent and uncultured activities <clears throat> without any reference to Vedic uh, authority. Higher than them are the Veda Mukhe Mani Dharma Nahi Gani. Those who give lip service, Mukhe Mani, they Verbally say, yes, I'm a Hindu, I believe in the Vedas, or I'm a follower of the Vedas, or I'm a devotee, or something like that. They say by mouth. They give lip service, but they don't actually do it. Whatever the forbidden activities of the Vedas are, they don't take those very seriously. They neglect them, and they do them anyway. Then... Higher than that are the karmanishtas. Those who are following, you have the, uh, what is it, that's the Madhya 8, I think. Instructs to not, maybe it's, maybe it's 7. Distracts Rupa Goswami. Here we go. Tarmadde manusha jati oti alpotor, tarmadde mlecha pulinda bodha sabor. Hmm? Although the living entities known as human beings are very small in quantity, that division may be still further subdivided. For there are many uncultured human beings like mlechas, pulindas, bodhas, and saboras. Then the next verse is Veda Nishta Modde Ardik Veda Moke Mane Veda Nishida Papa Kore Dharma Nahigane Among human beings, those who are followers of the Vedic principles are considered civilized. Among these, almost half simply give lip service while committing all kinds of sinful activities against these principles. Such people do not care for the regulative principles. Prabhupada mentions in the purport that the highest type of religious system is described in Srimad Bhagavatam 126. Thus, The highest form of religion is that by which one becomes fully conscious of the existence of God. His form, name, qualities, pastimes, abode, and all pervasive features. When everything is completely known, that is the perfection of Vedic knowledge. The fulfillment of Vedic knowledge is systematic knowledge of the characteristics of God. This is confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita 15.15. Vedaishya Sarvaira Hameva Vedya. The aim of Vedic knowledge is to understand God. Those who are actually following Vedic knowledge and searching after God cannot commit sinful activities against the Supreme Lord's order. However, in this age of Kali, although men profess to belong to so many different kinds of religion, most of them commit sinful activities against the orders of the Vedic scriptures. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu therefore says herein, Veda Nishida Papa Kori Dharma Nahigani. In this age, men may profess a religion, but they actually do not follow the principles. Instead, they commit all kinds of sin. Dharma Chari Karmonishta. 
Koti karma nishta madhyako gani shreshta. So among the followers of Vedic knowledge, most are following the process of fruitive activity and distinguishing between good and bad work. Out of many such sincere fruitive actors, there may be one who is actually wise. Koti gane madhe hoi aka jana mukto Koti mukto madhe durlabh aka kishna bhakto out of many such wise men, one may actually become liberated, mukta. And out of many, liber, uh, many millions of such liberated persons, a pure devotee of Lord Krishna is very difficult to find. So... <clears throat> Research, research is going on for the karmis, ganis, and yogis, but until the search is complete, no one can attain peace. Therefore, the Bhagavad Gita says, Gyatva mang santing richati. One can actually attain peace when he knows Krishna. This is described in the next verse. Krishna bhakta nishkamoto ivshanta bhukti mukti siddhi kami shakali oshanto. Because a devotee of Lord Krishna is desireless, he is peaceful. Fruitive workers desire material enjoyment. Ganis desire liberation and yogis desire material opulence. Therefore they are all lusty and cannot be peaceful. So here the objective of all the processes of uh, yoga, karma, jnana, the ultimate objective is to achieve Krishna consciousness. And that is achieved by studying the Srimad Bhagavatam. I don't seem like I have something in my eyes or something. <clears throat> the <clears throat> purpose of the Srimad Bhagavatam therefore, is different than other scriptures. When we try to explain to people what is the purpose of the Srimad Bhagavatam, <clears throat> it's very difficult to use the reference of other scriptures because the Srimad Bhagavatam sails far over their objectives. The Srimad Bhagavatam's purpose is to actually leave the material world and go back to Godhead. For most of the other scriptures' purpose is how to live in the material world with the blessings of God. O oh God, our Father who art in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. The objective is normally not to return to God. Even I was once preaching to one person, and just the thought of seeing God, the person started to get real nervous and say that, I don't want to see, I'm not ready. Uh, what would I do if God suddenly, you know, he got all just like uh, completely hysterical, you know, just the thought that suddenly, what if, you know, there, there came God, you know. It was like uh, completely flustered with even the idea. People, they're so far from God consciousness that uh, <clears throat> it's uh, very pitiful that here as a human being, they have the opportunity to achieve this highest consciousness. And that is made even more easily attainable by the mercy of uh, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. But they're completely neglectful of this, the summa bonum of life, the prime purpose of life. <clears throat> so 
So studying the Bhagavatam is so important. When the son of Chaitanya Das, Srinivas, he became about 16 years old or so, he immediately knew that the whole purpose of life was to study the Srimad Bhagavatam under a bona fide spiritual master. By this, the supreme goal of life could be achieved. So he wanted to study the Srimad Bhagavatam under a pure devotee. So he decided he would go to Jagannath Puri to find Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And that he would ask Chaitanya Mahaprabhu either to, to assign someone to teach him. So then his journey, how he you know walked through the jungles, walked all the way to Jagannath Puri, then finally, when he reached there, Lord Chaitanya was. See, big crowds of people, everything were there. He said, "What's happening? It's a big festival." He said, "Yes, the festival. Lord Chaitanya entered into the temple." He didn't come out. It was a festival of his disappearance, of his going back to the spiritual world. He said, no, no! No, how will I study the Bhagavatam? And he was just beating his head. He said, let me... Uh, uh, how will I know the Bhagavatam? Lord Chaitanya is gone. I might as well take my life. And he was contemplating committing suicide. And then... He just like fell unconscious and fainted. So then in his dream, Lord Chaitanya came and said that Advaita and Nityananda Prabhu are still on the earth. They're in Navadvipa. If you go there, by their mercy you'll be able to study the Bhagavatam. So don't take your life. Oh no, he told them actually to go. To Gadadhar Prabhu, I'm sorry. He would teach him the Bhagavatam. He would, by his mercy, could learn the Bhagavatam. So then, and he couldn't take his life. So then he went to see uh, Gadadhar Prabhu. So when he went to see Gadadhar Prabhu, just to make a long story <clears throat> a little bit condensed. Then uh, Gadadhar Prabhu was in complete separation of Lord Chaitanya. He couldn't speak to anyone. He wouldn't see anyone. He was just always crying and chanting and reading. He just couldn't uh, focus his attention in any other way. But when he saw Srinivas, he became very happy because uh, he knew that Srinivas was actually sent by Lord Chaitanya so he could feel the presence of Lord Chaitanya and Srinivas is coming and that relieved his separation. The Srinivas fell at his feet and paid his obeisance and begged for his mercy. They wanted to learn the Srimad Bhagavatam from him. Lord Chaitanya appeared to him in a dream and everything, in a vision. So then uh, he said that, well, I'd be glad to teach you. But uh, my Bhagavatam, by reading it, because it's all handwritten, and then meditating on the transcendental qualities of Krishna's pastimes, we can't help, we cried, and our Bhagavatam became washed out. They looked in the whole Bhagavatam, the pages were completely merged. So he said, you have to get a new Bhagavatam, otherwise how can I teach you? So that day, in those days, you didn't go to the local drugstore, I mean bookstore, and buy a Bhagavatam. He had to go and hire a Brahmana and for months he'd sit there and write the 18,000 verses of the Bhagavatam. And if you want purports, then... <laughs> so, <clears throat> Srinivas went back to Navadvip, got a Brahman, or some Brahmins, to start writing the Bhagavatam. Then, after they completed writing the Bhagavatam, took his big package of Bhagavatam on palm leaves, walked all the way back to Jagannath Puri, went to the Tota Gopina temple where Gadadhar was, saw that uh, there there was a festival going on. He said, what's the festival? He says, uh, Gadadhar Prabhu disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> and... Uh, 
course, uh, <clears throat> it was a crushing experience for Srinivas. Again, he practically went mad. Somehow, Gadadha Prabhu appeared in his. He fainted, and Gadadha appeared and said, Don't worry, you go back to Navadip, <laughs> find out Adwaita and Nityananda. Like me, they'll help you. So then again, he went back to Navadweep. He was already there, and he could. He, when he got back, then again he found that Adwaita and Nityananda. In the meantime, within that period, when he was there, they were there, but that, but in that period, they disappeared. Because <laughs> after Lord Chaitanya, then one by one, all the associates there stood separation. They just wound up their activities, and they went back to the spiritual world. No one wanted to remain in this uh, God-forsaken world. God had forsaken the world. He had left the world. So for those e e personal associates, they who were so intimately connected with God, with Krishna, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, they wanted to just re re rejoin him. So then again, he was completely <coughs> destroyed. <clears throat> Somehow, uh, he got the uh, order to go to Brindavan to find Rupin Sanatan <coughs> from Lord Nityananda and Lord Adwaita. So then he headed off towards Vrindavan, just a long walk with his Bhagavatams. Bhagavatam. So finally he reached Vrindavan. He was very, very happy to reach Vrindavan. He decided to take a bath in the Akura Kunda where Lord Krishna had it just at the outskirts. As he was Taking his bath, he overheard two brahmanas talking that how Vrindavan just wasn't the same since the disappearance of Rupa Sanan. What? What? He's jumped out, you know. What did you say? Rupa Sanan, where are they? What do you mean? Just, they've gone back to the spiritual world even now that Festivities and kirtans from their recent disappearance are still going on at the Govindaji temple. Then he ran all the way to the Govindaji temple, and there he learned that yes, Rupan Sanatan had disappeared. And then he just went like uh, completely into coma in the back of the temple. He just was unconscious. When he woke up, or rather he didn't wake up, but what happened was Jiva Goswami had received a dream where Rupa and Sanatan said that one great devotee, Srinivas is coming, you take him and you teach him the Bhagavatam and you have him take initiation from uh, Gopal Bhatta Goswami. And uh, so Jiva Goswami, he went to the temple and he found... Rupa Goswami, Goranga, just, you know, this person, like in complete unconscious state, just chanting the names of Krishna. And uh, in the back of the temple, tears pouring from his eyes. So then they thought, well, he, he thought this must be the person. So he picked him up and brought him over to his uh, little hut, whatever, his little ashram. And then... Uh, when he awoke, he said that, Are you Srinivas? I said, yes. He says, I am Jiva Goswami. <clears throat> then explained that uh, Rupa and Sanat have ordered me to do this. So. In this way, finally, Srinivas Acharya was able to find a spiritual master, able to find someone to teach him the Bhagavatam. I mean, he walked literally thousands and thousands and thousands of miles through unlimited uh, 
or did just he wanted to study the Bhagavatam. With this type of determination, we should actually vigorously, full attention, be studying the Bhagavatam regularly, trying to understand what are the actual essence, what's the purport of the Srimad Bhagavatam. You see, as especially we're so fortunate that Srila Prabhupada has written the purport, we don't have to carry around palm leaves. It's been put into this uh, printed form, very convenient to carry. You can get it in one volume, you can get it in 60 volumes, you can get it on microfilm, you can get it even on tape. So in this way we're very fortunate that we have the Srimad Bhagavatam. And we should regularly study the Srimad Bhagavatam with that type of eagerness as was exhibited by Srinivas, who was later given the title Acharya by the Goswamis, so he became a Srinivas Acharya. It was Srinivas Acharya after reading the Bhagavatam, then he was ordered to distribute the Bhagavatam. So this is also the pur- purport that we should understand that by reading the Bhagavad Gita, the Srimad Bhagavatam, these transcendental literatures, then it's our duty to also give them to others to preach this message to others. Not simply we read and become liberated and then we... It ends there. But we should continue on. It's like a transcendental chain letter. If each person that gets the science of Bhagavatam in turn teaches at least one other, but say if they teach ten others, one hundred others, then in this way the Krishna conscious movement can expand many fold and that is the only way of uh, even trying to repay although we can never fully repay that is the only way of showing our desire for repaying the debt is to be Krishna conscious and try to make others Krishna conscious Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Siya Dvaita Garadhar Siva Sadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Is there a question? Through preaching, preaching is not a stereotype, so many types of preaching. Festivals is one aspect of preaching, which is brings it to the public in a very visible way, involves them in a very wonderful way. So festivals is something which is very important, book distribution, home preaching, farm preaching. Yena tena prakarena krishna manani vosate By any means we are to bring a person to the point of accepting Krishna. And after that we introduce the rules and regulations. So initiation means at that time they accept to follow certain rules and regulations and chant Hare Krishna regularly. Yes, if they're trained by brahmanas, then they can learn how to do those things. Nucleus is always the preachers. If they're trained, 
by preachers how to do those things and they can start doing them in their home. Grihe tako bone tako sadahadi bole dako. Whether one lives in the ashram or whether one lives in the house, everyone should chant Hare Krishna. Of course, even in India now, we find that it's very hard to have a peaceful Krishna conscious life outside the ashram. Of course, it's even hard in the ashram what to speak of outside. But uh, in some cases. But we felt like, for instance, one family in India, he became Krishna conscious. So because he was a born Brahmana, he had a temple. When he took initiation, then the other caste Brahmin said, you took initiation from Amlecha. Therefore now you're no longer a Brahmana. They tried to ostracize him. Because they were smarter Brahmanas, they weren't Vaishnava. So they tried to say that uh, because uh, the Guru was not a born Brahmana, therefore somehow there was something defective in that initiation. But through preaching, he showed these bra- so called born Brahmanas, they were doing nothing. They were not vegetarian, neither did they do puja, neither, but by birthright they were claiming, and they were accusing the uh, others foreign uh, born Vaishnavas but who are following everything very strictly who are initiated into the Vaishnava Sampradaya they were trying to bring in caste consciousness with them so there was a big war threats attempts to beat up and so many different things they, they kidnapped one of the Namhat preachers and kept him uh, locked up in the house for a while but then finally, we, so we went there, we did a big festival. We had 20,000 people come. And then all the people came up and pledged to chant. And it was so overwhelming in effect that this Brahman is, you know, the cast conscious Brahman, even like the smaller, it's, it's like disappeared, you know. Today, many of them are coming to that program and have like surrendered, and the really bitter ones are just like, how do you call that? They're just uh, in the distance, eating their bitter pie. So, but uh, that person had to endure. So he was kept telling me he wanted to come and live in the ashram. But uh, in his particular situation, he already had a temple. He had deities. He had. If he, I, I saw that it would be very. Diff- it would actually be almost detrimental in his specific case to immediately come. He had a big family. And, we're not really set up for these big families yet. So it's not <clears throat> always so good uh, in some temples, you know. <clears throat> we have to mature how to provide and engage big families. Prabhupada wanted us to develop that type of farm project where we can actually accept whole families and engage them, give them a proper uh, Varnashram uh categorized engagement so that they can be completely fulfilled. But uh, that person did so much trouble. I remember once Prabhupada said in Mayapur when he told the, the people that you just come and stay here. We're providing you this facility so you can peacefully practice your Krishna consciousness. And even in India, if a person, for instance, we had, uh, before we had our own Guru Kul, we had grihasas and they sent their kids to the school at the Bhakti Vedanta Vinod Institute, which was established uh, by Bhakti Vinod Thakur, or in his name by Bhakti Siddhanta Sarita Thakur. Originally, only the sannyasis and brahmacharis would preach in, and teach in that school. But after the demise of uh, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarita Thakur, the Gaudiya Mat, they gradually reduced their preaching spirit and they put higher teachers in there and finally they took the government aid and then now it's become like a public school but uh, you know private school funded by government so it's like a public school practically speaking the teacher made fun of the student that why he was doing all these things 
and made some wisecrack, you know, completely atheistic wisecrack in the Bhaktivedanta Vinod Institute against uh, against this whole Vaishnavism and even against the existence of God. He's like a complete atheist. And then the students came and started pulling the kid Sikha in the middle of the class. He had to run back to the temple crying, you know. This was the Bhaktivinoda Institute, what to speak of other schools. <laughs> so, even in India, if you, uh, you know, you can be a Hindu, but you can't be a Vaishnava as easily as uh, it is to be a Hindu. You wear your sika in some places, you wear big tilak, you wear neck beads. I have girls who have disciples and they go to school with their neck beads. The other girls chide them. So you become a sadhu, you become a sannyasini, you know. Because they're standing out, they're, they're making a, you know, the others see that, all right, they're making a drive for becoming liberated. And then, you know, and they, they, they're forced to either preach and defeat them, or otherwise they're just, uh, you know, made the uh, mock of. So it's very difficult, even in India, what to speak of in the West. That's what's so surprising that, um, of course, when you have programs, the more mature people, the older people, they're still religious minded. But then if their son be or daughter becomes a devotee, they, you see all hell break loose. In Bangalore, I went, uh, the son was uh, becoming a devotee. He always initiated for three years. They said, let him get his Bachelor of Science. He got his Bachelor of Science. So then they put him in for Master of Science. And the boy was so attached to his parents that uh, he, you know, he, he, he did it. He came to me once and I just asked him, what are, you gonna, what are you studying? And he was studying some kind of computer communication, not programming, but some other really abstract use. Which, And I said, how are you going to utilize that in Krishna consciousness? Because I never thought about that. You know. He thought about it and it was like practice. He said, I want, after I graduate, I'll be a devotee. So how, then, you know, at least you study something. And I live in a temple. And you study something you can use. How are you going to use that? I mean, I don't mind in one sense, but uh, it's, a, it's a big investment of time and energy. But how are you going to use that? And then he meditated on it, and he couldn't find any use for it. But it was just because his parents were pushing him that he had to get his master's degree. So then he left and became a devotee in one of the temples. And then his parents came crying said, our son, he was the valedictorian, number one in the class, he should get his master's degree. Then I said, how will he use his master's degree to serve God? You said he can also join after he gets his degree. How will he use that particular... Uh, we don't know all these things, that's for you to say, you're the guru, but we just know that our son should get his master's degree. That we are parents, it's our duty in life. If our son gets a master's degree, then our life is perfect. And this is their conditioning. And they, they, they didn't think that if their son gets back to Godhead, that's the perfection. But, you know, the society, every, if their son gets a degree, then our son is a degree holder, then everything is uh, good. They, that's like, they're so conditioned now by the social pressure, even in India, that they just think if my son has a good job, or if he has a degree, then everything's all right. The, it may be a bomb, right? He may be lowest character, maybe, you know. But if he has a good degree, good, then everything is all right. <clears throat> so, somehow they've agreed, finally, through some reverse psychology, to let their son be a devotee. But uh, it's very, very difficult. So, what to speak of in the West, you find here a person wants to be devotee, they live outside, unless they get association with the devotees. Everyone is telling them, come and see the football game, let's go have a drink, have a joint, have a this, have a that. Some, so many mayas are there. So it's very difficult here. Here the mayas are more gross. There it's all family affection, get a degree, your mother crying and rolling on the ground and having fits if you... If you Mother serious, come back immediately. <laughs> if they may, your mother's dying, you have to go, you know. 
And the, literally, uh, one time Prabhupada, he told us that I don't even want to take any Bengali devotees anymore. <laughs> like, I got so disgusted, you know. The one mother who came and was rolling right in his floor in his room, was rolling back and forth, screaming, oh, 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 crying, rolling. <laughs> Going through, you know, all the ecstatic symptoms in reverse, you know. <laughs> And the boy was there, you know, and the prophet said, listen, he's free to go. Do you want to go? He said, I don't want to go. What can I do? He doesn't want to go. I can't force him. <laughs> In fact, one boy was pressed so much by his parents because he, because he was a devotee. He was pressed so much to leave the temple and come back. And when he left, he was so miserable that he committed suicide. You know, being just, you know, because they're very affectionate, the parents are very loving, but instead of they could, with a little push, their boy could go back to Godhead because they, they have some attachment for parents. It's natural because parents actually treat their kids nice. That's why I feel that when parents, if they give love and affection to their children in Krishna consciousness, and they have some, even just for the parental affection, just for the love of their parents, that uh, they can make so much advancement in Krishna consciousness. But instead, the parents, you know, due to their own materialistic uh, sentiments, they don't, they want the best thing for their son, but they just don't understand that Krishna consciousness is the best thing. They think they get a degree, get a job, have a family, have a house, this is the best thing. They're like Daksha, Prajapati, they're in the Karmakanda, they don't understand the Vritti Marga. They haven't understood the Bhagavatam philosophy. So even though they're pious people, even though they respect sadhus, but when their son enters the Nivritti Marg, all hell breaks loose. Don't even talk about what happens if a daughter wants to enter the Nivritti Marg. That, practically speaking, Prabhupada said, don't stand in between a father and his daughter. We don't even let daughters join the temp ashram unless their father gives a letter of consent. And basically we don't even encourage it. <clears throat> the sons, you know, if they're over 18, then we take the risk. But <clears throat> So one boy just recently, his mother and father took him to court in India. It was always like, we didn't believe it. They took him to court, said he was mentally insane, tried to do like a depro, you know, they, they had 150 boys from the neighborhood go to the courthouse waiting for him to come out to kidnap him and drag him back. He had to go to court and, and he had wrote a, an affidavit out that I am in good consciousness, I am on my free will, I'm 23 years old, I got my Bachelor of Commerce, I've decided I want to be a devotee, I'm, I'm a major, uh, I don't want to work, you know, as a slave or whatever. He just wrote his whole thing out, gave it to the judge. The judge said, can't be very insane to write all this. <laughs> Seems to be. So he gave the order. Well, he's over 21. The law is that uh, he's free to do what he wants. But then just, you know, there's uh, this whole mob, you know, that just, you know, he said, but of course, boy, you know, it's your mother. You should, you know. <laughs> even the judge, you know. But he was writing the order. You're free to, you know, because that was the law. But even he was like giving moral pressure. And the boy said, listen, I, I am gonna, I'm not leaving the courtroom unless I get escorted by, by a police van, you know, taken to the, taken out of here. But I, I can't leave because they're gonna kidnap me. They like took asylum of the court. Finally they had to give him a police jeep and take him to the god in Navadweep and then he got across over to my airport. This is in, you know, in the Dham. <laughs> so, you know, it's difficult and for people to be Krishna conscious. It's difficult. So in our ashrams, in our temples, actually, we're, we're, we're trying to do this congregational preaching. But and if a person really gets serious, there's some people that they'll be in a certain situation where it's very, very hard for them to actually be Krishna conscious outside just because the total environment is so rotten. So that's why the farm projects have to, are there to provide a very peaceful, nice place where people can 
use all of their energies and be Krishna conscious in a nice environment of Krishna conscious association. But of course, if we are, we're also trying to do this by making many people chant Hare Krishna and then combining them together as little groups, then they provide a type of association. And they, we're, Namhata is making congregations where there's no temple. You see, where there's a temple, you have your congregation. And where there's no temple, then you have many people chanting. You group them together and form them as a congregation. And they have like a preacher goes there and create the atmosphere of temple at regular meetings. But that's something that's just now being uh, instituted in the West. It's something we had to do in India. Otherwise, even their people, without association, it was very difficult. Everyone likes, and people can identify with that very much easier in India. There's not too much opposition except by communists, atheists, and other sampradayas. <clears throat> There's a lot of bogus yogis who claim to be avatars, and uh, they give opposition. But, uh, and these smarter brahmanas who say, oh, well, there's, it's just, it's very complicated. In India, you have many varieties of oppositions. In the West, it's mainly just Maya, just kind of gross Maya, just not so much complicated opposition. Maybe in the South, you have the Baptist Christian opposition, and you have just the gross sense gratification opposition. In South America, the Catholics, they don't really oppose much. They're really receptive. And then you just have Maya. So it's, that's why it's a very nice preaching field. So these temples, Bhaktivedanta you know, Thakur said, they form the manuculus. They're the place from where the preachers are trained, where they're sent out, where people can come and get purified. They can see the Nitai Gaur deity. The Lord Himself is there by having darshan, by coming and seeing how He's worshipped. They get purified. They can learn how to do this in their home. Or if it's too difficult, they can come and take shelter here and chant and, and Hare Krishna and be happy. And they can then practice the Nivriti Marga, be very happy, go back to home, back to God. Is that all right? Hare Krishna.